Uh, we will have our last talk by Steve uh, Wemeyer from uh, Champlain College, professor of um, uh, folklore, folklore and I think anthropology. He will talk uh, his talk uh, by, uh, by seen and unseen hands, spirit artists and their art uh, during um, the 21st century, which will be a perfect cap to our uh, uh, previous talks, which began with uh, historical overview, and then we had several other uh, speakers who addressed specific um, uh, issues of uh, uh, specific issues um, uh, in relation to this exhibit. So I hope that you will also come. And in the meantime, I will also make another announcement. In case you are uh, interested, we'll also have our annual Shadow Annual Dinner next Tuesday. Uh, Bill Schubert is our speaker. If you would like to uh, partake in, in this um, occasion, we still have some uh, spaces left. So I'm going to uh, leave uh, some of them. Uh, information and invitations here, so please take a look. <coughs> In the meantime, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to sing. <laughs> <laughs> you should. <laughs> you will do it better. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Anybody can do <laughs> something <laughs> that will be entertaining. <laughs> um, perhaps. Have you ever turned this off to construct it now? This is the first time spirits are probably doing something which is um, a little disturbing. I will also tell you last uh, week uh, on Wednesday we had a pre-Halloween night event which was uh, really a fantastic event. We never had this kind of occasion. So many people came. We had live music by Newberry College students. We had all kinds of tarot cards reading and um, uh, fortune tellers, spirit picture taking, and I hope that you will see it, uh, see us na next year because we hopefully will also do the same. If you wonder about this intriguing area here under uh, this uh, picture, it's temporary, but just for this week, um, the. Uh, uh, Solomon Jewett, uh, who was a collector and spiritualist and collector, uh, uh, thank, thanks to he, who we really have these wonderful materials here. Um, when I was planning this, uh, when we were planning this event, uh, we decided to do it a day before Halloween on October 30th. I only realized later that Solomon Jewett died on October 30th. <laughs> and when I did some math, I realized that also it's 125 years last oh Wednesday gosh. since he passed away. Uh -huh. His grave is um, uh, at Weybridge Cemetery. He died in Santa Barbara. Very interesting man, very dynamic, uh, multidimensional. He's buried here. Um, his body was transported by express train and um, uh, buried to his first wife. She's hiding behind the screen right now. But there is a, a spirit growing of Fidelia Jewett, so I would uh, suggest that you examine this wonderful portrait because despite the fact that he was married twice afterwards, he really requested that he's married by Fidelia. So he is, and so they are together. Um, <coughs> resting in peace. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Well, <laughs> what should we do? We're gonna, we're gonna we'll just do some talking. Uh -huh. Yes. So maybe in the meantime, I will tell you <laughs> about our distinguished speaker today, <laughs> Dale Cockrell who is um, a professor emeritus of mus musicology from Vanderbilt University, as well as research associate at the University of Free State in South Africa. Dale is a prolific scholar. He authored over 70 articles and 14 books. And uh, uh, here is one of the 
masterpieces here, and I think he's very generous offering a volume to anybody who would like to have one. And it, actually, the book is about Hutchinson family. He will be talking today about. This bird has something to do with it. However, hello. Something interesting here. This is Dale's last book. <laughs> you probably have heard about this book so because it's everywhere. And uh, with this intriguing title, everybody's doing it, Sex, Music and Dance in New York, uh, 1840 to 1917. Uh, wonderful, entertaining studies. Some of our, some people read it from us entirely, maybe. <laughs> I can comment about the takeover. So, uh, so this is um, uh, his recent achievement. Just click on it. Double click. Double click. Oh, he's been I also would like to tell you one more thing. <laughs> when I asked Dale initially to give a talk in conjunction with this exhibit, he was somewhat reluctant. He doesn't look like he's very happy no. now, but <laughs> hopefully he will cheer up in a second because uh, I think we should do our, uh, yes? What? Yeah, just, we'll just make it up. <laughs> you got the, um, you got your flash drive, I'll put the other yeah, computer up. Yeah, I do. Yes. Yeah. We will resolve this problem. <laughs> so, Welcome to Professor Cochran. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it is a pleasure, actually, to be here. <laughs> uh, we'll get this thing working, and if not, we'll have a good time just kind of talking about this stuff and making some sense as we go along. I want to thank the Sheldon Museum. I love the Sheldon Museum. I taught a course here in oh, 1981 or so, and so I've been a member of the Sheldon Museum for more years than I want to think. This is a, a valuable and important place to me and has been for a long time. And now I've even gotten my wife involved in this now. She's one of the trustees and, and the major fixer along the way. Um, I want to talk tonight about the Hutchinson family singers, and I'm expecting that I throw that name out there and most of you go, who the hell is the Hutchinson family singers? The Hutchinson family singers, probably in the 19th century, were the most famous musicians in America. They were widely known by everybody and widely hated by many. So it's both famous and infamous when it comes to the Hutchinson family. They, it's a, the Hutchinson family is a group of four singers, and I'd show you a picture, but alas, that's not working right now. That came from a family of 13 brothers and sisters in Milford, New Hampshire. The um, children of Jesse and Polly were 10 brothers and three sisters. And again, I wish I had the picture here because there's an amazing picture of the 10 brothers. It's actually quite a famous photograph. It's been reproduced in many numbers of places. Um, but it was the four youngest kids who really took up singing. Like most American families at the time, singing was really important. I like to, used to tell my students that 19th century Americans were probably the most literate group of, of people in the history of the world. Because of the singing, uh, the singing school tradition, people learned to sing in parts from the 1820s through the whole of the 19th century, loved to sing, people could read music. 90% of the people in some villages could read music. So singing was an important thing. For the Hutchinson family to start singing together was really not that exceptional. It's just that they had exceptional voices and they also had a, a kind of business sense that enabled them to do something like what they were doing. Uh, the four youngest of the, of the Hutchinsons, John, Asa, Judson, and Abby, um, who was actually the youngest of the bunch, are the ones who started out in this tradition of the Hutchinson family. They got together, they were, I mean, they had the same genetics in their voice, and I think that's one of the reasons that they could sing together so well, like the Carpenters and the Andrews and so forth. We've had that tradition. Um, started singing together, and in, um, 
1842, uh, after the haying season, because they were a farming family, after the haying season, uh, got permission from the parents to take a horse and a carryall, a kind of wagon, and set out on a tour, trying to make some money by singing, which was a fairly radical thing of the day. We have this notion that concerts are important, but the notion of taking a popular musical genre and putting it together with a concert and going out and appealing to people was really a radically new idea. So they were already kind of ahead of the curve at the time. So they got their carry all together. They headed up from Milford, New Hampshire, which is the southeastern part of New Hampshire, went to Concord, and again, well, here, I've got some notes here. <laughs> they uh, went to Concord and um, started keeping a journal. And there are free books going to be for you. We've got swag here tonight. <laughs> uh, there's free books, and these, this is an edition of the, those journals that they kept. Um, it's a book I did, actually, when I was in Middlebury some years ago. The publisher said he had 65 copies in the warehouse. He didn't know what to do with them. And I said, well, send them to me, and I'll give them to my friends in the Sheldon Museum. Uh, well, actually, I didn't say that, but they're here, and I don't need them in my shed. So if anybody wants a free book, the books are free. The signatures are going to cost you an arm and a leg. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they, they um, struck out from Concord, New Hampshire on their way. And one of the early entries in the journal is written by Judson. Again, we have a nice picture of Judson if we had the PowerPoint working as beautifully as it was 15 minutes before you got here. And Judson wrote, We left the people of Concord in ecstasies, and that is the way. Our evening's performance was nothing compared with the suffering we had during the night with the tarnal skeeters. And there are bumps on my head now as big as bullets, which you may call bumps of skeeter ratedness. And the reference, of course, is to phrenology, where the bumps on the head kind of determine your personality, your character, your future, and everything else. So Judson's already picking up on one of these social reforms, which is phrenology, and we're going to be talking more about those as we go. They headed on to Hanover, New Hampshire, where they saw the students at Dartmouth at the time. And then they took Route 4 across Vermont. I guess it wasn't Route 4 at the time, but that's what they're tracking. They go through a Woodstock. They head over the Killington Gap to Rutland. And brothers being brothers, Asa made this entry of the trip. Before we arrived at the highest peak, Killington, of the mount, we, the Aeolians, and they called themselves the Aeolian Singers at the time, it's the Hutchinson family, had a scuffle in which Judson had his wristband torn off, Abby had her fingers numbed, and I had my coat torn and the skin of one of my knuckles bruised. The particulars I shall not state as I may in the minds of Judson and John deviate from the truth. I will barely say that I was pretty severely struck by Judson before I retaliated. <laughs> it was an occurrence long to be remembered. It's one of the things I love about these journals. Is that these people are not talking for an audience, they're just keeping a record of who they were and what they spent on things and what their feelings. It's interesting that Judson, though, is the one that they, that they keep talking about. Because Judson was probably the most musical of the quartet, but he was also the most disturbed. Um, they ended up in Whitehall, and Judson had the horrors. He would get a hold of the journals sometimes when he had the horrors, which would be a kind of depression. And disjunctive snatches would follow in the journals. Saw a hog as big as an elephant. Weighs 12,000 pounds. Saw this morning a boy roll a stone from the top of the Great Lodge, killed four horses, knocked the Great Hog over the scraggy steep about 100 feet to the White River, feel pious. A few sparkling drops, my hopes are shattered. Why don't you? Hope it pulled. Can't get me a new dress. My tassel on your pants. Another boat come in. Have our shirts tomorrow. Nice buggy. Yes, get a pineapple if we get lots of money tonight. Um, so <clears throat> they try to keep the journals from Judson because he'll go off like this. And Judson um, 
Judson eventually the depression gets to him, and in the, in the 1850s they find him. Uh, he hung himself and actually took his life. On, on, on to Saratoga Springs and then to Albany. These were times of small audiences, and one of the uh, one of them puts in the journal, "How do you suppose we feel? Money all spent, and we poor beggars. The fact is, keep up good carriage." Eat now and then ice cream at Briar and Walker's Saloon, and wisdom will increase and knowledge be spread abroad. Our motto oh, is actually a pretty good one for you. Hey! Hey! Slideshow. There's a slideshow icon. I, I know. It's really hard to drive this little thing. There's nothing on the screen. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. On there? Can you make it just flip through and we'll just. There we go. There we go. Woo! Yay! Okay, well, let's, uh, can you get out? <laughs> uh, all right, so, uh, all right, here's wow, the ten wow, Beautiful. Yeah, we just don't make family portraits like that anymore. <laughs> Look at That's that. Wow. This actually is in the Smithsonian, and I've seen this reproduced in some photo albums along the way. So the ten brothers, I don't have one of the three sisters. Here's the quartet. This is 1844. This is after they've started to hit it big. Um, and Abby is really interesting. She's the youngest one. When she starts on this tour, she's 13 years old. And this is a time in which women appearing in public are usually theater people, actresses, and we know what they are. And all it wants to have a young 13-year-old woman out of a, a Baptist family out of Milford, New Hampshire, going on the road with her brothers was a radical thing. But you can kind of see good looking people, aren't they? These are rock stars. <laughs> I've got a friend who teaches a course in rock music and he says, of course, I always started with the Hutchinson family. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes a lot of sense, actually, because these are people who are not only selling music in a concert venue, they're also selling their attractiveness. Um, every male in the world was after Abby in the 1840s. And John went through, uh, he wrote an autobiography, he went through a lot of women in his lifetime. <laughs> so this is Asa, who's the bass, this is Judson. Um, Asa actually, I think, eventually is going to move out west. Okay, this is the first family concert in 1840 in Milford, New Hampshire. I was thrilled to find this thing. Um, and the interesting thing that you, you see here, this is the first handbill the Hutchinson's ever had. Scrolled there by John Hutchinson himself on it. Um, this all came, the, the journals and things like this. I was at Dartmouth one year and I had a motorcycle and I took a motorcycle trip. It was a beautiful day. And went to Milford, New Hampshire, which is the hometown. Stopped in at the drugstore and said, Do you have any things from this old Hutchinson family? Oh, no, you might go down to court. Clerk, maybe I know something, so I kind of went around. Somebody said, go down to the library. I think they've got something down there. So I went to the library and said, do you have anything? The Hutchinson family, and they pulled out the published books, and I thanked them very much for it. And then they said, oh, there's an old scrapbook down in the, in the, in the basement. Would you like to see that? And that contained these journals that I then edited, and things like this as well. So some of this wonderful stuff here came from taking a motorcycle trip to Milford, New Hampshire <laughs> in uh, 1978. Where's wow. Judson? <laughs> um, they, they also play instruments. So Asa is playing a string bass, which is uh, a cello, sorry, which is a common instrument in church. In fact, all of these instruments would be common. The two men, two other men, uh, Judson and John, played fiddles or violins. Um, Abby sometimes played guitar, and eventually they'll start to take some keyboard instruments with them as well. Here's Briar and Walker's Ice Cream Saloon. I thought you'd kind of like that. Apparently this is not Briar's Ice Cream. You would think it would be. <laughs> but Briar's Ice Cream is in Philadelphia, and as far as I've been able to tell, there's no connection to Briar's and Walker's Ice Cream there in Saratoga Springs. Well, just south of Saratoga Springs, they go to Albany, and for the first time, they start to get some real <coughs> professional managerial help. At this point, they're trying to invent themselves. And the audiences are small, not too much is happening. 
They get there, a guy takes them under his wing, he says, change your name to Hutchinson Family Centers. Get away from this aioli and vocalist stuff. <laughs> and um, it starts to give us some, some advice about how to get audiences. And by the end of 1842, they're starting to give some concerts now here in Boston that are drawing hundreds of people to their concerts. So they're really kind of on their way. Early 1843, they give concerts in Boston to overflowing audiences. <coughs> and by this time, the older brother Jesse, and you need to keep that name in mind, he's going to show up here several times. The older brother Jesse takes them under his wings as the manager. He's also the lyricist for the group. And we're going to run into quite a few of his lyrics here as we go away. Then on to New York City, 10th of May, 1843, the Grails. Oh, New York is all that I have represented it to be. Boston does not compare with it for life and business. The Splendid Street Broadway is the most splendid street that I ever saw. And then the Grand Park and the splendid waterworks where the water is thrown into the air to a height of 25 or 30 feet and then falls into the pool again in the most majestic style. Oh, New York is the place for me. <laughs> What they're, what they're uh, enjoying, the waterworks, here is the result of 1842 when the Croton Reservoir starts to fill. And there's a subtext to that because for the first time in the history of New York City, fresh water is available for the citizens. To that point, of course, wells are in the backyard. You can imagine how polluted they are. And it's one of the reasons that Americans in the early 1840s are consuming about four times the annual amount of alcohol that even I consume. <laughs> Maybe even you. <laughs> so it is a, a period in America in which uh, drunkenness was a common problem in part because people didn't have access to anything except spirits and fermented, um, uh, fermented uh, beverages. So the Croton Reservoir. Uh, the Croton Reservoir, does anybody know where it was? Yeah, okay, good. We've got some people. Where? No, I missed your question, sir. Okay. Pardon? Croton, New York. Oh, well, that's where the reservoir, uh, that's the, where the dam. The end point was where the New York Public Library was. That's right. It's at Bryant Park. Bryant Park. And uh, the only app I've ever bought on my phone is one for, for altitude. And so I was sitting there in Bryant Park. It's 72 feet above sea level there. So that provides a kind of gravity fed to much of New York. And it's going to enable New York to start growing up, for example, because now we have water that can go up three or four, uh, three or four floors. Of concerts that they're giving in New York, the New York Tribune. The room was crowded to the utmost, seats, <coughs> aisle, and passages, even convenient places to stand. These charming vocalists sang in the most beautiful and effective style, and were loudly and repeatedly applauded by the intelligent audience. Their style of singing is admirable, simple, sweet, and full of mountain melody. Their voices are all rich and clear, and their whole execution is in the most chaste and graceful style. By that time, also the toast of New York, 1844 to Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, where they sing for Daniel Webster, President Tyler. Their repertoire at this time, I'm not going to pull any musicological things on you, but I thought you would like to see generally what the what they're singing. So this is in New Haven in 1844. The interesting thing about their program is that in this, embedded in this, are songs that are patriotic, idyllic, nostalgic. Death is somewhere embedded in there. Songs about mother, home, religion, aspirations of genius, romantic idealization, sentimentality, comedy, historionics, social problems, politics, and family life. So a range of songs that speak directly to the concerns of, of average Americans at the time. All of these, I don't have the lyricists or the composers, but all of the lyricists are American, and all of the composers are American. And that's something that's starting to matter and give definition to who they were. <clears throat> One review. But this, an American, a true Yankee entertainment, this family proves to a certainty that we have American musical talent. In the 1840s, there's a real concern about identity, American identity. 
we have writers, we have Washington Irving, but music was something that was a little late, and people were wondering if the Americans had any kind of musical ability at all. The Hutchinsons were starting to answer that. Another review. The Hutchinsons do not torture us with this ro most romantic and affected Italian jargon, nor with this nerve-rasping, kraut-digesting Hessian minstrelsy, <laughs> nor with French squealing, nor Spanish squalling, but they give us the eloquence of music and the natural harmony of their natural voices. <clears throat> there are no shrieks like the yell of a Potawatomi squall and the hug of a grizzly bear. <laughs> no swoonings, no crocodile tears, no supercilious rolling up of the eyes, no affected, affected palpitations of the heart, but all is as simple and graceful as an alderman dissecting a canvas back duck, and yes, the metaphor escapes me too. <laughs> okay, one last review, I don't want to bore you with these, but one last review, one so keen, I think, that it's a, it's a kind of capsule summary of the most salient elements of the Hutchinson style. This from the Brooklyn Eagle, Daily Eagle. We do wish the good ladies and gentlemen of America would be truer to themselves and to legitimate refinement. With all honor and glory to the land of the olive tree and the vine, fair-skied Italy with no turning up of noses at Germany, France, or England, we humbly demand whether we've not run after their beauties long enough. The music of feeling, heart music, as distinguished from art music, is well exemplified in such singing as the Hutchinsons with the richest physical power, with the guidance of discretion and taste and experience, with the mellowing influence of discipline. It is marvelous that they do not entirely supplant the stale second-hand foreign method which its flourishes, its ridiculous sentimentality, its anti-Republican spirit, and its sycophanting, tight-tainting the young taste of the nation. We allude to and especially commend the school of singing, because whatever touches the heart, is better than that is merely addressed to the ear. Elegant simplicity in manner is more judicious than the dancing school bows and curtsies and inane smiles and kissing of the tips of a kit glove a la pico. Songs whose words you can hear and understand are preferable to a mass of unintelligible stuff. Sensible sweetness is better than all distorted by unnatural nonsense. That by the music critic of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, Walt. <coughs> New York, 1845. Concerts are bringing in $1,500 per night. Wow. $35,000 a day in our kind of contemporary, being divided five ways, night after night after night. These are people who become filthy rich in the process of singing <laughs> for America and establish the concert, you know, how we can take popular music and, and monetize it in a way that we didn't before. Then they took American music to Europe in 1845, becoming among the first to have done that. Again, a slow start, certainly some setbacks, but in the end, England, Ireland, and Scotland turned out to be charmed as much as America. Charles Dickens wrote to the Countess of Blessington, I must have some talk with you about these American singers. They must never go back to their own country without your having heard them sing Hood's Bridge of Sighs. My God, how sorrowful and pitiful that is. The, Hut the Hutchinson family were attracted to Hood's poem because of its appeal for social justice. In fact, the Hutchinson family were already into what would be decades of involvement with social reform movements. Temperance. We've already spoken a bit about the Cold Water Army. They sang a song called King Alcohol. They signed the pledge, and they pretty much lived their lives alcohol-free. Food reform. This was a time in America in the 1830s when people ate lots of meat, and on the side they had lots of meat. <laughs> <laughs> and one Sylvester Graham in the 1830s said, no, Americans, you need to be eating a lot of grains and fruit in addition to eating all of that meat. The Hutchinsons became uh, adherent to the Graham philosophy. Sylvester Graham is known to us today for having invented a whole wheat cracker, which is named after him, the Graham cracker. 
medical reform. Well, we're past the time of bloodletting, fortunately. <laughs> Leeches are not very important at this time, but by the 1830s and the 1840s, if you had an illness, by and large, the potion that you were prescribed was calomel. And the Hutchinsons sang a song called the Anti-Calomel Song, and they sang it to the old hundred. Da di da di da di da da, kind of right like that. The active ingredient in calomel was mercury. <laughs> and so by getting, just saying, you know, just, just let the illness work its way out. Basically, they were doing Americans a service and singing songs about that. Meta um, yeah, the Thompsonians, I should have said that this is a result of Samuel Thompson. Indian rights. They're singing songs about the plight of American Indians in the 1840s. The Indian hunter is skewing what's happening to the American Indian. Human, human rights. The pauper's funeral. Immigrant rights. The Irish immigrant lament. And this being written before the blight forces Irish people to come to America. In fact, the Hutchinsons, when they were in Ireland in the, 18, in the fall of 1845, they were farmers. They inspected the potato crop. That's the year that the blight starts in Ireland. And as far as I know, they were the first to report back to America that the potato crop really doesn't look very good this year in Ireland. Uh, they wrote a piece about what they were seeing there. So. Um, Irish immigrant women, labor relations, the bridge of size, mental health, one of their famous songs was called The Maniac. And the maniac was a maniac because he'd been incarcerated. He'd been incarcerated for so long that he had become the maniac at that point. Women's rights. The Hutchinsons established a town in Minnesota in the 1850s, named it after themselves, Hutchinson, Minnesota, this is south of Minneapolis. IBM plant was there for a long time. Uh, full voting rights for women in the 1850s in Hutchinson. Um, and the women were encouraged and for some time did wear pants, bloomers they were called at the time, um, just because it enabled them freedom of movement and also made a statement about the rights of women. They called themselves communist. They visited and stayed at Brook Farm Commune. And they were especially connected with the Florence community. So much so were they taken with the notion of communes that they went back to the family farm and established it as a commune. They brought money in, but the people who needed to stay there and work the fields and so forth did it all together, and the finances were divided kind of accordingly. Didn't work very well, but at least the idea was one that at the time had some nobility associated. And then, Spiritualism. As you know, there are many strands that come together to form spiritualism. But the star power for spiritualism is provided by these women, the Fox sisters from near Rochester, New York. That's Leah on the left there, Kate at the top, and Maggie here to the right. Leah is about 15 years older than the other two. You can see there's been some uh, cosmetic surgery. But, um, <laughs> um, but anyway, Leah is considerably <coughs> older than the others. The reason that these are important is that the two younger ones had um, a kind of special skill where they could keep their feet on the floor and snap their toes. And the room would kind of resonate with the wrappings made with their toes. And people went, what is that? Oh, it's got to be spirits. And they would go, spirits here? And this, the tap would go, yes, don't. <laughs> and before long, the Fox sisters were known as the people who, through their rappings, could speak with the other world. So this is where the notion of rappings and the spirit world gets started. They continued to do that until the 1840s, uh, to the 1880s. And one of the sisters finally exposes what they were doing with their toes to cause the wrappings. But we've got 40 years here in which Americans are gaga over the notion of wrappings, and other people learn how to wrap in some way or another while they're doing it. They also pick up on what the Hutchins were doing and realize that not only can they do this in their house, but they can take it on the road. And we start to have seances, we start to have programs, 
And these women also become quite rich as a result of that. Soon enough, the Hutchinson family were all over this of the new social reform, especially Jesse, the lyricist uh, who was older. Uh, Jesse was quite involved in the gold rush to California and went back and forth several times. One of his trips, he, would, he came back over the Panama uh, Isthmus. So he had to, there wasn't a canal there, so he had to go over. He caught yellow fever as he was going over, and in May of 1853, he died. But his powers moved on through the spirit world, since so uh, he was involved in that. And from there, he actually managed to convince the Fox family that they could become the Fox family singers as well. Oh. <laughs> the Haunted Ground, as sung by the Fox family. You can't read this down here, so I'll read it to you. Music from the spirit land, affectionately dedicated to the friends of spiritual progress and reform by Jesse Hutchinson. The music of this beautiful song was dedicated to Mrs. Fox, was dictated to Mrs. Fox through the medium of the rappings while sitting at the piano. So she's sitting at the piano and Jesse is talking to her and she's writing down this music which they published, the sheet music by Judy Reed, it's a big publisher. Um, Jesse was an inspired musician from the other side, I read through this once, it's a really not very good piece. But, um, but anyway, how interesting that the Fox family think they could emulate the, uh, the Hutchinson family by starting to take this out of the road. This is, this is Mom Fox, by the way. So we've got the three sisters there. Taylor, can you tell me what rappings means? It's the rapping sound oh. that you make when you snap your toes against it. So people identified that as just rappings. Right, and that's where the word goes from then on. So. And it's not proven or unproven whether it was true or not. Pardon? It's a matter of believing whether Fox sisters. Uh, that there's a lot of uh, complexity in this story that they supposedly claim that they made it up, but there are also other theories. Yeah, okay. so just wanted to bring that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jesse also showed up in a, a seance uh, conducted by Mrs. Fitch, and this was held on February 16th in 1854. And a report was drawn up of the sales. Lights. We're going to have a sales. So. One more. Get in the spirit. <laughs> I hear some rappings here. We sat around the table in the usual manner. The hands of each individual resting upon the table. And engaged in social chit-chat. While waiting for some demonstrations from the invisible world, we had a right foot padded as by a human hand, and the right leg of our pantaloon strongly pulled by some unseen agency. This was done repeatedly, though we said nothing at the time, but thinking it might be possible that the foot of some one of the company might undesignedly be in contact with our own, we cautiously felt around to ascertain if this was the case, but there was nothing. And the moment we put our foot down, the same familiar tappings and jerks followed. The presence of several spirits was indicated during the evening and satisfactory tests were made. But the most communicative and efficient one purported to be that of Jesse Hutchinson. It was he who had been playing Bo Peep with us under the table. Heavy raps were now made on the floor. And on being requested to that effect, Jesse beat a march. It seemed to us Washington's march. In admirable time and in the most spirited manner, no drummer could have done it more skillfully. He was then asked to beat time while the company joined in singing several tunes. The old granite state, among others, which he did to perfection. He then spelt out the following communications by the alphabet. I am most Happy, dear friends, to be able to give you such tangible evidence of my presence. The good time has truly come. The gates of the New Jerusalem are open, and the good spirits made more pure by the change of spheres are knocking at the door of your soul.
Obviously, there. His name was William Lloyd Garrison, <laughs> which is a subtle kind of segue into my next part of the talk: abolitionists. The Hutchinsons were first hesitant to proclaim their commitment to this most explosive of social reforms, by, but after getting to know some of the proponents of immediate emancipation, they risked their audience by coming out for abolition in early 1843. You can imagine. So we've got an audience here, middle class people who are willing to pay lots of money. The audience is split when it comes to anti-slavery. Do we want to stand up and sing what we believe in front of an audience like this? Eventually they decided that they did, and probably it's because they came to know well this man. The Fugitive Song, Words composed and respectfully dedicated in token of confident esteem to Frederick Douglass, a graduate from the peculiar institution for his fearless advocacy, signal ability, and wonderful success in behalf of his brothers in bonds, and to the fugitives from slavery in the freed states and Canada's by their friend Jesse Hutchinson, Jr., 1845. So here he's pointing to New England. You can't see that. The hounds are kind of back there uh, following him. Hutchinson's became fast friends with Douglas. Uh, in 1843, the journals say while they're in the Florence community, that Judson shared a bed with Frederick that night. And they possibly also played an early form of baseball at the Florence community with Frederick Douglas in 1844. They bumped into him again in 1845, I think it was in Boston and learned Douglas by that time had published his autobiography that revealed himself to be a fugitive slave. And he was uh, leaving for England to get out of the country at the time. Hutchinson said, we'll go with you. And it's at that point that they boarded the ship with Frederick Douglass. They were one of only two others, I think, that went with him as, as, uh, as friends and journeyed across the sea, a turbulent, turbulent trip as far as Frederick Douglass, who of course was forced to be in steerage at the time. And it's 50 years later in 1895, the last words heard over the entombment of Frederick Douglass was a song, sung by John Hutchinson. Once the Hutchinsons were out, typically they were quite passionate about what they believed, and they became these singers for anti-slavery. 25th of January, 1843, report on the meeting of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society published in William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator. I never saw such effect on human assemblies as their appeals produced. They made the vast multitudes toss and heave and clamor like the roaring ocean. Orpheus is said to have made the trees dance at his play. The Hutchinsons made the thousands of Faneuil Hall spring to their feet simultaneously as if in dance and echoed the anti-slavery appeal with a cheering that almost moved the old revolutionists from their stations on the wall. On one occasion, it was absolutely amazing and sublime. Wendell Phillips had been speaking in his happiest vein. It was toward night. The old hall was somber and gloomy. It was thronged to its vast extremities. Phillips closed his speech at the loftiest pitch of his fine genius and retired from the platform of the four brothers rushed to his place, took up the argument where he left it on the very heights of poetic declamation, and carried it off heavenward on one of their boldest flights. Jesse had framed the series of stanzas on the spot, while Phillips is speaking, embodying the leading arguments and enforcing them as mere oratory cannot, and as music and poetry only can. And they poured them forth with amazing spirit in one of the maddening Second Advent tunes. The vast multitude sprang to their feet as one man. Oh, it was glorious. And it was not the rude, monocratic shouting of the blind partisan or the unearthly glee of the religious maniac. It was 
was humanity's jubilee cry. There was music in it. I wish the whole city and the entire country could have been there, even all the people. Slavery would have died of that music. Mm -hmm. And our problem is that in 2019 or 1995, whenever those recordings are made, they go to the sheet music and we type in the sounds. And so it turns out to be really four square. Popular music at this point, that's a chart. Okay, there's a little bit of it. <laughs> okay, that's enough. <laughs> um, that is, you're, you're not going to find it nearly as exciting as the, uh, uh, as obviously what's going on here. Now, if we could get it, I, I really wish we could get that next slide. I can try. Yeah. Can't you crack down or use the arrow? Yeah, try your arrow. Yeah. Your button. It should make yeah. it go back now that you're on. Going down. Oh, yeah. good. See? Okay. I don't know what it's All right. This is their vehicle for anti-slavery. And this comes out in 1844 called Get Off the Track. And you can see something of the iconography here. I'm going to have to give you because it's not blown out much. Uh, the um, engine here is called the Liberator, which is the name of William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper. And it's ringing its Liberty Bell. There. It's up there. And it's pulling a train called Immediate Emancipation. Oh, there it is right there. Immediate Emancipation which of course is the slogan of William Lloyd Garrison and, and the Liberator. Into the station with the banners, the Herald of Freedom, which is the New Hampshire uh, newspaper, and the American anti-slavery standard flying here on the top of it. People are running to get on board in another engine. The Repealer is pulling Liberty Party votes and ballot boxes. In 1844, a third party, the Liberty Party, which is the anti-slavery party, is also putting forward a candidate for, uh, for president. And in the background, two trains are coming on track. One of them is called the Clay. Henry Clay was the Whig candidate that year. The other one didn't have a name on it because James K. Polk had not yet been nominated. So it's just kind of blank thing. And um, so this is really about the election that's going on in 1844. It's this, the get off the track is fit to a pre-existent tune again. Old man Tucker with a mind, old man da 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 Some of you know this old man Tucker. Came out in 1843 as the big hit of blackface minstrelsy in that year. So there's a kind of, they're trying to recapture that tune, that great tune, and take it away from the blackface. A minstrel troupe at the time. So Old Dan Tucker needs a great tune as well. In performance, they knew when to ignore the notes on the page. Their outburst at the convention and Jesse Silvery get off the track is absolutely indescribable in many words that can be penned. It represented the moral railroad and characters of living light and song. With all its terrible ingenuity and speed and danger, when they came to that chorus cry, get off the track! It gives name to the song <coughs> when they cried to the heedless pro-slavery multitude that were stupidly lingering on the track and the engine liberator coming hard upon them under full steam and all speed, the Liberty Bell loud ringing, they standing like deaf men right in the whirlwind path, the way they cried, get off the track in defiance of all time and rule, this magnificent sublime. They forgot their harmony and shouted one after another, they're all in confusion and outcry, like an alarmed multitude of spectators about to witness a terrible catastrophe. But I'm trying to describe it. I should only say it was indescribable. It was life. It was nature transcending the musical step. The gamut, the minimal, the setting breed, the ledger lines. It was the cry of the people into which their overwrought and illimitable music had degenerated. And it was glorious to witness them alighting down again from their wild flight into the current of song, like so many swans upon the river from which they had soared a moment wildly into the air. The multitude who heard them will hear me witness that they transcended the very province of mere music. I hope that gives you some sense of how exciting this music must have been to people. 
Who wrote that thing? Jesse Hutchinson writes the text. What you just read? Oh, this, it came to the report to in a New England Anti-Slavery Society meeting. I can find it for you if you want it. It's in the book, probably. We may not know the names of the Hutchinson family, but what they wrought lives with us still. The Hutchinsons are making American music, American popular music, popular. And they were making it modern. This is music for ordinary people. It was music that was approachable and consumable. It was music that was easy to listen to. And it was American from the first. And it was American at the end. And it was music that sang truth to power. <coughs> when I went to Milford to uh, look at and ended up working on the journals here, there were two journals. And one was actually in the scrapbook there so I could see it. There was a transcript to the other one. And so the original was not there. So I did some research trying to figure out where that thing was. And as far as I know, the last person who had it was Pete Seeger. Yeah. Speaking truth to power. Right? Singing uh -huh. truth to power. I got in touch with Pete and I said, do you know anything about this? But apparently his home was a kind of a hoarder's heaven. And he said, he said, I have no idea where it is if I ever had it, and who knows where it's ever gone from there. But anyway, we have a transcript of it. You can't see it, but up there it says, music made subservient to the advancement of peace, freedom, and virtue. And down here, let me make the songs of the people, and I care not who makes their laws. Yes. What does one shilling stand for? Pardon? One shilling. Uh, twelve and a half cents. Is that an English shilling? No, it would be that. Oh, that? Yes, I'm sorry. This is this is when they're in England. So, yes. Okay. Arouse, let thy soul break in music thunder. These are people whose songs and lives were filled with music thunder. That told their age what all that science had meant. And it's a music thunder that rolls over us yet today. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs>
and they go through and and um, the text gets changed. Okay, so so you want do you gotta get off the track? Yeah. This performance yeah, is a little better. Yeah. Did you turn it off? Mm -hmm. Emancipation rides majestic through our nation, bearing on his train the story, liberty of nation's glory. Roll it along, roll it along, roll it along through the nation, freedom's car, emancipation. Roll it along, roll it along, roll it along through the nation, freedom's car, emancipation. First of all, the train and greater speeds the dumbest liberator. Onward cheered amid hosannas and the waving of free banners. Roll it along, roll it along, roll it along. Spread your banners while the people shout hosannas. Roll it along, roll it along, roll it along. Spread your banners while the people shout hosannas. Let the ministers and churches leave behind sectarian lurches. Jump on board the car of freedom, ere it be too late to need them. Sound the alarm! Sound the alarm! Sound the alarm! Puppets thunder, ere too late you see your blunder. Sound the alarm! Sound the alarm! Sound the alarm! Puppets thunder, ere too late you see your blunder. Rebels to emancipation cannot rest on free foundation, and the tracks of the magician are but railroads to perdition. Pull up the rails! Pull up the rails! Pull up the rails! Emancipation cannot rest on such foundation. Pull up the rails! Pull up the rails! Pull up the rails! Emancipation cannot rest on such foundation. Blackface Minstrel Show, given its fraught, fraught political aspect, had brought a kind of energy to the stage that now was sweeping American popular music. I mean, it's it's a string band, and the Hutchinsons are picking up on this, as, as are the blackface people picking up on that as well. So it's an exciting time. Stephen Foster is 16 years old in 1840. So he's getting ready to do O Susanna in 1847, four years later. In American popular music, the world's music, is not going to be the same after that. So in a way, Gilbert and Sullivan are really Stephen Foster kind of watered down. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to keep that in mind, that American popular music is coming to a strong maturity. I, I still like to tell my students that Stephen Foster is the world's most popular composer. I have heard his music in Zulu, Russian. We were in Slovenia one time, and they were singing in Slovene, uh, in Russian. And I, one time I was uh, directing a Japanese program at William and Mary, and, they, and the director stood up to sing this Japanese folk song. <laughs> yeah. They sing in Japanese. Yeah. So, so it's music that's known all over the world and has been for 150 years. Probably 
more people know the music of Stephen Foster than anyone yeah. else. Yeah. I got to sing that song in ninth grade at an operetta. We did it in Old Kentucky Garden, right? So I got to play the lead and sing Beautiful Dreamers of that. <laughs> uh, but I'm thinking, you know, with Bill Hart here in his talk about the great reforms, and I'm thinking about the maybe parallels in this idea of the zeitgeist and the spirit of the time, right? That's coming through in all these changes. Is there, I mean, I'm curious about the maybe parallels and other things that were Red work that uh... absolutely. I'm sure Bill picked up on that as Bill's talk was going on. I was thinking, oh, I've got the perfect example for that. So, yeah. I mean, the Hutchinsons kind of pull so many of these strands together and live it and take it out to the public in a way that's important and sing about it. So, you know, it's it's kind of like a, you can sing things you can never say. Yeah. Um, the Marriage of Figaro could not be presented as a play because it was words, but Mozart could sing those incendiary words. And it's the same way the Hutchins get up there and they can sing things that people can't say. We've yeah. always been able to sing. I was thinking though, there, could there be like some kind of an impulse that comes through humanity that reemerges from time to time, right? And could there be these great reforms that were going on? And I'm thinking about the follow-on to the Hutchinsons. Mm -hmm. There is the St. Cecilia Music Society, you know, that tried to preserve music. Were there other, besides, uh, you know, Pete Seeger maybe in the modern day, did people carry forward the impulses that the Hutchinsons so, did so well? Oh, yes. I mean, what kind of examples were there? Other well, that, that music can be political and that it can speak to, speak to the concerns of ordinary people is just a a main theme in American popular music through rap. You know, it's still with us very much today. I think that's been maybe the main stem of American Through popular. rap? Yeah. Like rapping, like not telling no, them not rapping. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. no, I, think for, I think it's something Dale said earlier was talking, and that is how Americans begin to express themselves as Americans. Yeah. So you can see What's happening with Hutchins of singing, you can see this in art, painters yeah. who are trying to capture the American landscape. You right. can see this in uh, writers, <coughs> James Fenimore Cooper, writing about the American past, but he said the present. You can see this come around again during the Great Depression, when you see this rise in uh, the collection of folk, uh, folk music, folk tales. Uh, yeah, yeah. Who's going south collecting all these? Uh, <laughs> Alan Lomax. Uh, Lomax, right, in, in, uh, during that period. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great, a great time of exploding American folk culture, trying to figure out who are we as Americans during the Depression. Well, in, in, a part, in part, that's what my book, uh, Everybody's Doing It, Sex, Music, and Dance in New York, is about, too. It's when you get down to the level of ordinary people in New York at that time, whether it's in the dance halls or whatever, they're trading licks. And they are black licks and white licks and Irish licks and you name them and we're picking up on them and that's where the music that Americans have loved has always been made and it continues to be made. So you get down far enough and there's a kind of willingness to accept a diversity of musical culture that once you get to the middle degree college level, you don't do it so much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know what I mean. I taught there. I know what that is. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean by that. So that's what that book is about as well. I also wanted to, uh, I don't know if you uh, came across this information. In 1858, there was a radical, there was this convention, Ratland Convention in 1858 in Ratland where people from all over the United States, supposedly over 2,000 of most progressive thinkers, suffragists, spiritualists, abolitionists, women, you know, from all over came and held this convention for a few days. We have a pamphlet here in the case downstairs, and some of these uh, 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 proposed reforms were quite uh, radical, even, uh, you know, from point of view of our, how we think about things. And I, uh, I uh, while reviewing this pamphlet, I noticed that Hutchinson family was invited to provide music. I don't know if they ever showed up, but they were the musicians uh, to, you know, to 
entertain people. So. Okay. <laughs> Um, I have one more. Who was the artist for a uh, number of the posters? Did I, I know. I similar, you know, I have no idea. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good question. Photographs or engravings? But well, the sheet, music, the sheet music we can identify. I doubt it. Yeah. Well, the posters may have some information on yeah. there, but, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Are your visuals from the scrapbook? Most of them. Yeah. And most of them are in this book, too. So uh, many of them are from the scrapbook or from other places. I, spent years trying to dig this stuff out. Mm -hmm. I gave up on it 35 years ago, and I want to thank you for forcing me to think about it again. <laughs> it was actually quite fun. And tell us what Florence was, because I'm not familiar with that. The Florence community, it's in, in Northampton, Massachusetts. Yeah. There were many of these that yeah. cropped up. And Florence was one, I mean, we know Brook Farm probably yeah. is more famous than that, but Many people were involved with the Florence community as well. And I don't know exactly why the Hutchinsons attached themselves, but mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass was there. So he, he was coming there as well in 1844. Did the Hutchinson farm in New Milford have an name? Uh, I know where it is. The farmhouse is still there. It was yeah. for sale a few years ago. I tried to get the American Musicological Society to buy yeah. us. And, old musicology far, uh, house for us to kind of go live in, you know, this, <laughs> but it's still there. It didn't have a name. I think it was just the uh, Hutchinson Farm, so. Uh, now, do you know Milford very well? No. 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 Okay. Yes. Just, just a quick thought. Um, Florence is near Northampton, right? It's yep. very yep. near. And each spring there's a special event that's held on the Smith campus. It's called the Silver Court Bowl. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot, of, it's all these great a cappella singers and multi part harmonies that you know have this spirit that just goes on for all day. It's, I wonder if there's some connection to that in that. You know, only in that, and I left this out of the talk, I had it in there before. Um, David will be able to talk somewhat about this. Uh, in that, the style, this is an oblique answer, but I think I'll get back to it. The style of American singing up till 1840 was, man! <laughs> we get that time and again. It's, it's that kind of style, and we loved it. We still love it. <laughs> we do, don't we? love it right now. <laughs> we do. But the Hutchinsons, people keep talking about the Hutchinsons as having this incredible blend and it's in part, I'm sure, because they were genetically related and their voices probably did, did blend together. But they introduced this notion of four parts not doing that kind of bad singing, but doing it in a blended kind of way. When I was here at Middlebury and was doing this book, I got some people together and four of us, and we tried to recreate that sound by singing these songs with a concern for an a cappella blend yeah. in there. So, yes, the, the whole tradition of this American blend, this is the first time I can find it in American music, is with the Hutchinsons. Thank you. Since Middlebury and a cappella has come up several times in the last few years, I'll put in a plug. The Saturday night, 7 o'clock, Brandon Historic Town Hall, the State at 8. Good. Middlebury's yeah, a cappella group will be performing okay. for, for free or, or whatever donation you would come to leave at the door. They were dissipated 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> apparently it's the same guy. I know. <laughs> Seven and a half. <laughs> okay. Right. Let's slide home. Right. Thanks. Thanks.